Stand and let's get ready to worship the Lord together. So good to be with you and going to enjoy some worship tonight and we'll come to the communion table. If you didn't get a communion element, you could slip up your hand. We want to get you one of those and want you to be able to enjoy that. So they'll bring those down. And then we're in the fall tonight in Genesis. So we're going to dig into that. I believe God wants to speak to us. Uh, but without any further ado, let's settle our hearts. Let's pray. And as always, let's, let's ask the Lord to come and fill this place with his presence, right? Amen? Amen? Father, thank you for this evening, God. Thank you that, Lord Jesus, we get to come to you just as you are, Lord. That, God, you, you wouldn't have us come to you any other way, Lord. When we do, in pretense, in pretend, Lord, you see through it anyhow. So, God, tonight we come, Lord, if we had to drag ourselves here tonight, Lord, we come like that. Lord, if we're coming this evening just riding, Lord, flying, sensing we're on the mountaintop, Lord, we come like that. But Father, we come to you, Jesus. You're the one that we're here for. And God, we pray, manifest yourself. Speak to uh, each man and each woman's mind and heart. And Lord God, we are just looking forward to what you're going to do in and through us, Lord, among us here this evening. And we just commit this time to you now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of love. 
God, that we get to be in your presence, Lord. Thank you for the cross, Lord. And just as we sing this next song, Lord, may we just be reminded of your grace and your mercy, Lord, and all that you paid on the cross for us.
Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Yes, Lord. Father, tonight we do. We, we're so grateful that we get to be in your presence, Lord. As your word says in the book of Hebrews, it says that, that we can now come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. And Lord, tonight we're just so grateful as we sing out that the veil that once separated the holy place from the holy of holies, your very presence, that Jesus, when you went to that cross, the veil was torn in two from top to bottom. Lord, telling everyone, anyone who would come, that they can come all the way up to your throne. That Lord Jesus as you did with Moses, you want to do with us. As your word says, you spoke to Mo Moses, Lord, face to face as a, as a friend speaks to his friend. And Lord, tonight we're so grateful that Jesus, you said in your word, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friend. God, we're so grateful tonight to be friends of God. Lord, that you are with us. God, we pray tonight as we, Lord, as we do every Wednesday, Lord, as we slow down and we come to this table, to the communion table, the Lord's Supper, God, we pray that you would just sow into our hearts, into our minds, Lord, the reality that, Lord, this has all been made possible by you, Lord. Not 99%, 1% us, 100% you, God. So, Lord, once again, we, we come and we pray, uh, honor this time, Lord, and we thank you. Thank you, thank you. Go ahead and be seated. If you need a communion cup, you just slip up your hand, and we'll get you a communion cup so you can participate. Come to the table. So, so good. Good to be together. You know, I, I hear a lot of people, you know, around the church world talking about unity, the need for unity. And, you know, I believe that uh, one of the greatest ways for us to be unified is to eat of the same bread and to drink of the same cup. Is to come to the, to the tuner, right? <laughs> to, to, the, to the Lord Jesus and to be tuned to, to him, right? To come and as uh, we sang tonight, at the cross, I bow my knee, right? At the cross, we, we all humble ourselves. At the cross, we all have need for what he's done for us. So if you have the bread, let's take that out. Let's remember that tonight. You know, it's always interesting, right? In a body, a church body, there's some of us here tonight, man, some of you guys are going, man, I've never been happier in my entire life. And then the person sitting next to you is going, I've never been beat up more than my entire life. You know, it's, it's just how this thing goes. It's amazing. And, um, you know, but, but we, we have, guys, we must, 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 must remember. We must remember, right? We, you know, when I first got saved, there was this song out. It was called, I found Jesus, right? I found Jesus. And I remember singing that song, and I'm reading my Bible, and I was so convicted. This is a new Christian thing, you know? Now I'd be like, I praise the Lord, the Lord Jesus, right? But back then, I couldn't sing it. I couldn't sing it. Because I, I, I would sing this. I'd be like, Jesus found me, you know? I would, because I felt so convicted, because I was like, I didn't find Jesus. I was, I ran from Jesus, right? That's the song. But he got me, you know? It's, we must remember tonight. We got to remember this in our walk, that it's what he has done for us, right? So, not what we're doing for him that's keeping us. It's what he's done for us, right? So if you have the bread, let's take that out. And, oh, Father, tonight we just thank you. As we remember, Jesus, what you did for us, Lord, not what you're going to do, but what you've already done. On the cross, you cried out. You said, it is finished. You said, te telestai, paid in full. All of our sins have been paid for, Lord. Every, even in our minds, some of us still tonight as Christians still think we still deserve some wrath for this thing we did that one time. But Lord Jesus, tonight we just remember that, that you you took our punishment. Lord, tonight we remember you took our place. That that was, um, 
That was our cross. Those were our nails. That was our crown of thorns. But you took it. And Lord Jesus, tonight we remember that. Lord, we remember that you laid down your, your life for us. That's how, that's how we're saved. That's how we've been born again. That's how we are Christians tonight. So Lord, we just are so grateful. Lord, we remember what you've done. And tonight, Lord Jesus, we eat in remembrance of you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's partake. You have the cup. Let's take that out. Hmm. You know, just just a reminder tonight. If you've uh, how many of you guys have read the or studied the book of First Corinthians? First Corinthians, anybody? So in First Corinthians, uh, Paul has to address the church there because they're coming to the communion time with all these wrong ideas, right? And and one of them, you know, one of the, some of them was. Uh, you know, they were, eat, they were eating it early because it was like a snack time for them. <laughs> we make sure that you, none of you guys do that. Most of you guys go to eat the communion going, oh, this is the worst, but Jesus, I love you, right? But they, they, they would do that, right? There was all these things, and Paul will tell them there in Corinth, he'll say, many of you actually have become sick, like physically ill because you're not, you're not coming to this communion time in the right way, right? You know, it, the Bible tells us in the last days, the hearts of men will fail them. We're literally watching this. You know, people are just spiraling out of control. And, and, and the blood of Jesus, listen, the blood of Jesus speaks to us of, of better things, the Bible says. It speaks to us. It reminds us it's not all on you, man. You know, if you're here tonight, you're just anxious, fearful, worried, just it's overwhelming. The enemy would love to do that. The, the blood of Jesus speaks to us that the greatest thing that's ever happened in our world or our life was 100% Jesus. And, and he's going to continue to be faithful like that. He's going to continue that. We have to trust him, right? We have to rely on him. And tonight, just, just uh, I pray as we partake that maybe God would even heal some of us here of worry, anxiety, fear. And Lord, tonight as we hold this cup in our hands, we remember, Jesus, that you are physically on this earth. You were not a phantom. Lord, as the Gnostics would say, you, you, you didn't walk on the ground but not leave footprints behind you. Lord, you walked amongst us. You were born into this human frame. And Lord, at the end of your life, you were crucified on a Roman cross and your blood was poured out, Lord, to the extent that the Roman soldier pierced your side and blood and water came out. And tonight, Lord Jesus, we believe as your kids, Lord, as as the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, we believe that it is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, that has cleansed us of all unrighteousness. We believe tonight we stand, we sit, we are before you, holy, justified, just as if we've never sinned, not because of our good works, not because of our great faith, but because of your blood. And Lord Jesus, we just thank you for the poured out blood. We thank you that the promise of Isaiah is for us, that, that though our sins were as scarlet, you've washed us and made us white as snow. And tonight, Lord, we praise you for this. We remember your poured out blood. We pray, Lord, wash us afresh again tonight. I pray anyone here that is just burdened, I pray anyone here tonight that the enemy is just pestering. Lord, I just, as the blood would go on the doorposts of the home there in the Passover in Egypt and the angel of death would pass over. I pray even now as we partake, the pleading, I plead the blood of Jesus over every one of your people. Lord, just wash us, remind us who we are in Christ. Remind us that we're in the Father's hand. No one can pluck us out. So Lord, we just thank you for your blood and we drink tonight in remembrance of you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's partake. Hmm. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you. God, we appreciate you. We love you. And God, we pray tonight, continue. As your word says, if Jesus be lifted up, he will draw all men and women to himself. So Lord, you be lifted up. Draw us to you. You're the one that we truly need. 
So Lord, draw us to yourself tonight, we pray. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 All right. Well, good evening. Why don't you stand, give somebody a handshake, a hug, tell them good evening. All right. All right, guys, go ahead and find your seats. Go ahead and find your seats. Very, very good. Very good. If you need a Bible, you can slip up your hand. We'll get you a Bible. You can follow along with us. And I would encourage you guys, if you don't have a Bible, this is our gift to you. We want you to have it. This is a Bible study. You will get as much out of it as you put in. And uh, man, do I want you to get a lot out of it. So, you know, I encourage you, if you don't have a Bible, slip up your hand. We'll get you one. We want you to be able to follow along with us. A um, couple quick announcements. I know we've uh, just been a lot, lot going on around here. I know they're going to be doing the, the, the Book of Job play. And as I said earlier, you know, I, I knew this would be good for our church because there are a lot of you are, are definitely characters. You know what I mean? So I figured this would be just perfect. <laughs> I, I believe God's going to use it. I do. I do. I believe God's going to use it. I believe uh, people are going to come. I, I believe people are going to get saved watching the Book of Job play. I'm just going to put that out there. So, but I know they're going to be doing, uh, the, uh, Robert told me, casting calls. And I said, what in the world is a casting call? What is that? Is this some sort of fishing or instrument? I don't know. A cell phone? Is a, what is this? But no, apparently you got to audition for this stuff. So, uh, the Holy Spirit will lead. I don't know. But uh, we're going to do this Sunday and then next Sunday, 1230. So if you're involved in that and uh, uh, you want to be a part of that, just go back to meeting room one. You could jump in on that. It's going to be exciting. And then also this Sunday, I know we're going to be doing a, um, uh, we're gonna be doing a class. Um, the Lord's been putting this on my heart, crash course. Over the summer, we're going to do a couple. And this Sunday is going to be how to study the Bible to get the most out of it. And uh, just looking forward to that. It's going to be about an hour uh, just think it's going to be really beneficial. So I encourage you, if you can stick around, stick around. You'll be blessed. Uh, always try to just give you the tools. You know, here at Calvary, I'm always thinking, we're always thinking like this. Rather than feed a man a fish, we want to teach a man a fish, right? Does that make sense? So uh, just to get in the Word, how do, we, how do we get as much out of the Word as we can? So we'll have that this Sunday after church. Um, so it's going to be just, just a great summer. I believe God has a lot in store for us. Um, so be praying, be praying. Um, you know, I, I told you guys if we did the baptisms, what, was it two Sundays ago now or last, two Sundays ago, right? And I told you, 22 baptisms, man, Satan's not going to take it easy on you. And some of you guys are like, I've had the greatest week of my lives. And some of you are looking at me going, and I said, I told you, right? So just, I encourage you to stay the course. God is with you, you know, um, you know, it's so exciting. And you know, the beautiful thing is at the end of the summer, August after vacation Bible school, that last Sunday of the month where we do our, our big uh, outreach in the park over here, we'll have more baptisms. And there's more people, there's people that already need to be baptized. You're going, it's two weeks ago. That's amazing, right? God adds to the number. So I'm um, looking forward to that, but continue to pray for those who were baptized. I'm sure uh, the enemy's not going to take it easy on them, right? Not all of a sudden you turn your life over to Jesus, start reading the Bible. Satan applauds and all the lights turn green from now on, right? So uh, just be praying, be praying for those folks, you know, um, just a, a great, wonderful time, but uh, the enemy definitely will, will press. So that is it in the way of announcements. If you guys have your Bibles, let's open those up all the way back to the beginning. We are doing our through the Bible study in Genesis. We are up to chapter three. And this evening, we're going to look at verses one through seven. And I promise, listen, for you guys that have been with, with, with me as we've been going through the Old Testament, you know, we were up to the book of Job, and I says, no way, and we came back to Genesis. Um, we'll, we'll, go, we'll do Job soon. But I usually do a chapter at a time, but I, I've just, as I've been studying, I think these, these areas of Scripture, the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings are so important. They're so important that you nail these things down in your walk. And I do believe, as the prophet Hosea says, right, he says, my people perish for lack of what? Knowledge, right? That's it. So I think as we, we really rightly divide the word and we are Bible students together here, that especially here in Genesis, you know, want to make sure we nail these things down. So we're going to do part one this Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we'll do part two. And it is simply the title is The Temptation and Fall of Man. 
the temptation and fall of man. And we're going to be all over the, the Bible tonight uh, as we go through this. Really want to nail this down. We're going to talk about original sin. We're going to talk about Adam's bomb, right, and the fallout that ensued for you and I. Uh, what the Bible has to say about this serpent of old, Satan. Um, we're going to look at what God's word unveils about him. So we're going to talk tonight, the temptation and fall of man, part one. Um, Genesis chapter 3, our Bible should be open. Let's pray, and uh, as always, let's ask the Lord to bless our time uh, in his word. Hmm. Father, tonight we gather, and Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you tonight, Lord, not just with our hands or with our voices, but now, Lord, we worship you with our attention. God, we do believe together tonight that, your, that this Bible that we hold in our hand is your very word. Jesus, as you said, heaven and earth will pass away, but you said my word will, will never pass away. And Lord, you have something in it for each one of us tonight. All things, Lord, that pertain to life and godliness, we have in you and in your word. And through your word, Lord, you cause us to grow in grace and to grow in knowledge. So tonight, Lord, as we consider the fall of man all the way back at the beginning, God, as we learn about it, Lord, for some of us, for the very first time, for others, we've studied this before. God, we pray, Lord, give us victory, Lord. Show us that you're the Savior. Lord, reveal to us, if we're here tonight confused about our need for a Savior, reveal it to us and show us, Lord Jesus, even here in Genesis chapter 3. And we ask it now in your name, we pray. Amen. As we've been going through Genesis, a couple things just to kind of give us the big picture. You know, most scholars believe the, the author of Genesis is Moses. You might say, but Moses wasn't there. And we could talk about this at another time, but but generation after generation, you'll see these ages, you know, we'll talk about this later in Genesis when we see the genealogies. Uh, this would have been passed on to him. And most do believe it was Moses himself writing this. This book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. That's actually what the name Genesis means. It's beginnings. It's the birth. It's, it's, every, it's all the, the, the first stuff, right? And it's very important we understand this because there's, a, there's a, a law in the Bible called the law of first mention, meaning we can discover the core of any topic in the Bible from the first place it's mentioned. And as you would imagine, most of the first places things are mentioned are in the book of Genesis, and tonight, we're going to talk about the fall of man. Tonight, we're going to talk about something none of us are familiar with, sin, right? Nobody knows what sin is. We're going to talk about a, something tonight that none of us really like to talk about, the enemy, the serpent, the devil, Lucifer, all these things that the Bible calls him. We're going to see that tonight. And we're going to see the fall of man and how it affects you and how it affects me. Um, I'm going to start with a story. It was many years ago. My, uh, my kids, Beth and Luke, were just toddlers at the time, and we lived in a, a house upstate in Sullivan County in Rock Hill. We lived right by this incredible stream, and it, you know, I never knew any place could be this quiet. You know, it was so quiet. You could feel the quietness. You know, some of you guys are going, give me the address. I'd like to go there, right? But I remember one day, you know, we, we had this mouse problem in this house, and uh, I'd catch the mice, and I'd put them there, and uh, we didn't even have garbage pick up there, so I'd put the trash down in the basement, and once a week, I'd drive it to the dump. And one day, I was down there, and one of the bags was just filling up with mice, and I went down the steps, and there it was. It was just massive snake. You know, it was a big snake. Now, you'll see, you'll see not this week, but next week, God will curse the snake and say, I'm going to put enmity between you, and, and, and most people don't like snakes because God says so. Now, there's a couple weirdos that like them, you know. Other than that, no, I'm just kidding. If you're here and you like snakes, we love you. God bless you. But this particular snake was in my house. He was at the bottom of my steps. But the good news was he was dead. He was upside down. His tongue was out of his mouth. I saw him. I said, man, I got to go get a shovel, get a bag, throw him in the garbage. I go upstairs. I tell my wife, I said, babe, there's this big snake downstairs. Good news, it's dead. You know, so I got to clean it up. She looks at me and goes, honey, maybe the snake was just playing dead. I looked, I, I laughed, you know, I don't know if the men have ever done this before, and I have to confess this. I laughed at my wife. I laughed at her. I said, snakes play dead. 
Are you kidding me? Snakes don't play dead. Look at its head. It's only this big. How big is its brain? The size of a grain of rice? Can't play dead. Well, I got to the bottom of the steps, and then my wife laughed at me because <laughs> the snake wasn't there anymore. And that's when I, oh, no, right? Now I knew it was man versus snake. I think there's a show on television about this. And I couldn't find it. I finally found it in the corner, and this thing was just trying to strike me, and I was trying to strike it. And as you can tell, I won. I won the battle. I'm here tonight, you know, decapitated. I shared this story once at another church. A man came up to me. He was like, I can't believe you killed the snake. I was like, I'm sorry, you know. But I had to do it. It was me or the snake. It was my family, my children. No. But listen, tonight we're going to see this introduction of, of the snake, you know, the snake of all snakes. The enemy himself. And this is a reality, guys. You know, this is something that a lot of times people don't want to talk about. Um, and it may make him feel uncomfortable. But as we are going to dive into the scriptures, it's important we realize that God's in charge of this whole thing. He's in charge. And we're going to pick it up, Genesis chapter 3, uh, without any further ado. It says, now the serpent, can I say serpent? Serpent. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Watch this. And he said to the woman, now this is the serpent, says to the woman, watch this, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And I want you to note there at the end of that is a question mark. You could circle that. This is, in essence, the first question in the entire Bible. The first question. It's kind of not a question. It's like, you know, it's kind of an accusation question. I don't know if anybody's ever asked you one of those questions. Why did you do that to that person? You're going, uh, that's not a question. That's an accusation. But anyways, it, it was the first one. If you're taking note tonight, the first uh, principle we want to take here, the temptation and fall of man, number one, is Satan questions God's word. You got to realize this. This book you, you hold in your hand has been attempted again and again and again throughout human history to be destroyed. And the reason being is this book is very powerful. This book changes lives of men and women. This book has changed continents. And it's not the book because this is what's called the logos, the word of God. The word in Greek is logos. It preexisted the invention, the Bible. And when, you know, the Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. Listen, Jesus is going to be holding a new King James version, you know, study Bible in heaven. The word of God is, it's the truth of God, but this is how we get to learn it. And the first thing we see here is this serpent questions God's word. Now, what's very interesting to me, if you're taking, I'll jot this down, the serpent hadn't been, you know, introduced, uh, you know, we, we hadn't been introduced to the serpent before, but now that we are, he immediately goes to work and goes right for the throat. Do you notice this? He comes on the scene and immediately he comes with his best attack. I want you to realize this. This is how the enemy works. The enemy comes at us with his best attack immediately. He, he's very impulsive, and, and that's what we see here. And he goes right for the throat. Now, who is the serpent? <laughs> what is the identity of the serpent? You know, um, similar to when you were in school, do you remember this? All the answers were in the back of the book. I don't know if they still make textbooks like that, but I'd like to tell you anybody who writes textbooks, I always appreciated that. It helped me a lot in school. But the answers are in the back of the book. You can turn there or you could just listen. Revelation chapter 12, 7 through 9. I'd really encourage you tonight, jot some Bible verses down. You could chew on them later. Revelation chapter 12, 7 through 9. Listen, the Bible tells us who the serpent is. Revelation 12, 7 through 9 says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Watch this, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out. If you, you have your pen, you can underline it. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Here, John the apostle on the island of Patmos getting this vision uh, of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, and here we see the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old. It's talking about Genesis chapter 3. Who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, this is important for us to think about these things. How did we get into this mess? Right, as you look out on the world tonight, you know, you, you see what's happening around us. I mean, it's interesting. It's, it's sickening, really. 
that people are going to go into, you know, places where their children and, and hurt them. How do we get into the mess we're in tonight? Where did all the problems in the world come from, right? Where did it all come from? Can we really blame, now this is going to be a tough one. Some of you are going to want to say yes immediately when I finish this, so just listen. Can we really blame all of our problems on the media? I know you guys want to say yes, but you're being good. Can we blame all our problems on Washington? Can we blame all our problems on Democrats? Can we blame all our problems on Republicans? That's what we'd like to do. Because we'll see, we're not going to get there tonight, but next week when we study the rest of chapter 3, you're going to see immediately the blame game begins. But it's much deeper than that. It goes back farther to the serpent, the devil. And this is important. This is important. For you note takers, jot this down. Satan, right, his name actually means adversary. He's an adversary. And how did he come into being? Who is this adversary the Bible speaks of? Satan, Lucifer, we're going to see that tonight. This serpent. Did God create him to be evil? Now, I'm going to flip. I told you we're going to be kind of all over the scriptures tonight because I really want to nail this down for you. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11 through 15. Ezekiel 28, 11 through 15. Listen to this. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a, a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, thus says the Lord God. So listen, this is a prophecy of Ezekiel. He had just in chapter 28 begun this prophecy against the prince of Tyre. And some scholars say, well, this isn't Satan. This is just uh, uh, another man. No, but he calls him the prince of Tyre at the beginning. Now he's going to move to the king of Tyre. And you're going to see as he begins to describe this prophecy of Ezekiel, it can't refer to a physical man because you'll see there's, the description is very clear. Uh, uh, son of man, verse 12, son of, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. So we know it's not the prince of Tyre now because he wasn't in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. Note that these are musical instruments that were apparently a part of Satan's body, Lucifer's body. Timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I establish you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So now this fills in a little bit more gaps about who this serpent is. Here in Ezekiel 28, it tells us that the serpent, Satan, is, was a cherub, an angelic being who was in Eden. Satan was a cherub. He was a, a created being, an angel, not us. Now, now, some people get confused on this, right? Because the Bible tells us that, that mankind, that now we're, we're a little lower than the angels, right? And you may wonder, and you know, I'm not going to say, thus saith the Lord, but as you study your Bible, I believe this to be true. Before the fall of man, we, we, were, we were light. You know, we walked with God. And I believe before the fall of man, like God, the Bible says, basically Jesus was walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day on a daily basis. He wasn't doing that with angels. And now all of a sudden, man, before the fall, I do believe was above angels. After the fall, boop, right, we dropped down because we're created as we saw in Genesis chapter 2, we're created, let us make man in our image and our likeness. And I believe that Lucifer there, this anointed cherub is there, this, you know, we see this. He's got the uh, angelic being who was in Eden. He's complete, the Bible tells us. He was wise. He had beauty. But we, we will find out, we'll find out his name, Isaiah 14, verse 12. We'll see that in a minute. Or Lucifer. But listen, it's almost as if Satan there in heaven was a type of a heavenly prime minister, uh, assistant to God, so to say. Uh, some would say a worship leader. His body, we see timbrels and pipes, instruments. And we can connect these dots, you know. You know, very likely in charge of the worship of God of the angelic hosts. But as they worship God, the Bible tells us here that iniquity was found in his heart. 
He's watching on and he begins to ask himself this question. And we're going to fill in the, the gaps here with the Bible, not with our own ideas, right? Um, we're not going to ask demons to tell us about Satan because Satan is the father of all what? Lies, right? So probably not the most reliable source. I know there's been volumes of books written of information people got from demons. I'm going, probably not the best source, you know. But anyhow, we're going to turn to the Bible again. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 17. What happened? What happened? God created him. Did God create Satan to do all this evil? The Bible tells us no. Iniquity was found in his heart. But Isaiah 14, 12 through 17 gives us a, an understanding from the Bible what happened. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. His name Lucifer means day star. I mean, he was literally a star. <laughs> literally. Literal light, literal heavenly use, eternal purpose. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. Verse 13, this is what happened to him. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. These are called the five I wills for you note takers. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. <laughs> Lucifer said, I'm going to be God. Verse 15, God says through the prophet Isaiah, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to hell. It wasn't going to go the way he thought it was. To the lowest depths of the pit, those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners. Listen, some may question this, but I want to tell you right now, Jesus Christ himself in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, I know I'm giving you a lot of scriptures, but that's because one of Satan's best tactics is, get to, is to get people to believe things that aren't true about him. When the Bible tells us these things. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, listen, Jesus says this. People go, I don't know about Satan being cast out of heaven. Well, Jesus clears it up. Luke 10, verse 18, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Is that cleared up for you? You may want to highlight that. You know, one time this guy was like debating, well, the theologian blah, blah, blah told me. I said, let me help you real quick. Luke 10, verse 18, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I said, either Jesus is nuts or you're wrong. Case closed. All right. You know what he said? He goes, I've never seen that before. Oh, well, there it is. Good. Jesus links Satan's fall from heaven to, to this event, to Isaiah. The I wills, you know. The I wills. You know, Lucifer, a star, but wanted to be the director. <laughs> he wasn't content with being the movie star. He wanted to direct the film, right? Five times he says, I will. And up to this time, up to this time, there was harmony in the universe, folks. Up to this time, there was one mind. Now there's a, a rogue will, a rebellious mind. Somebody that's going to say, I can do it better than God. You know, who says, I want to rule the earth. Well, we don't really have the time to get into this, but if you study Revelation, the seven years of tribulation is where man kind of gets what they want. They go, well, we want to see, whether they know it or not, if you reject Jesus, what you're actually saying is, I want a season where Satan gets to run things, or he's the CEO. You know what that's called? It's called the seven years of tribulation. Read Revelation 6 through 19. Nice leisurely reading at times, right? And you get to see what it looks like when Satan's in charge. It's not too pretty. Right, but this is where he comes in, and he first questions God's word. And what he does is he says, the Bible says there, he said to the woman, now listen, in our minds we see the serpent, but now this is the cursed version of the serpent. This is after God deals with him after this. But this is not just the serpent as we'd think. Obviously, I mean, if you talk to snakes, you're, you're a strange person, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and his words he spoke were understood. <laughs> this, you know, Eve doesn't go, huh? I don't speak that language, right? It's common language, apparently. And this was a creature, this serpent. For, for you note-takers, jot this down. The Hebrew word is nakash, nakash. And it literally means to hiss, whisper a magic spell. This is the Hebrew word that they use to describe him. But also in Hebrew, sometimes translates to a shining one. 
So, you know, it, it, and we see that in Ezekiel's uh, prophecy of Lucifer. You know, it, it's not a snake in the way we think of a snake. Um, I don't want to spend all our time talking about the snake. But, you know, before the, 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 end, the, the devil himself uses the snake as a, as a conduit to bring about rebellion of man against God, uh, this was apparently uh, a beautiful creature, a shining creature. And I want you to understand this. Satan in advance, according to Scripture, had already created a rebellion against God in heaven. Now, as Jesus tells us, as Isaiah tells us, he's now cast from heaven to the earth because his agenda failed in heaven. And now as he hits the earth, what does he do? He immediately tries to advance his agenda on earth with the first man and the first woman. And the first thing he says there is, has God indeed said? This is it, guys. Satan has not changed his tactics today. <laughs> you know, all the stuff that was going on, right? The last season with the coronavirus and all these things. At the end of the day, what we tried to do here was come back to the Bible and say, well, what does the Bible say? What did God say? And then Satan would come in, has God indeed said, right? This is what he's, then this is what he's doing now. Up until this point, God's word has been very important in creation. Remember, God said, let there be light. There was light. God spoke, there was light. God's word was what he used to create. Hebrews 11, verse 3, for you note takers, jot it down. God's word is so powerful. If you're here and you're going, I need more change in my life, I need to grow, you need to get in God's word. Hebrews 11, verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. So up until this point, God's word was very important. Now all that he has said is being challenged by the serpent, by Satan. He's coming. He's challenging God's word. That's what he does. He's still doing it to this day. He's still doing it to this day. Now let's move on. <laughs> you go, I thought we were, now you know why we're not going to get the whole chapter, right? Verse 2. Okay. And the woman said to the serpent... We may eat, notice this, the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it. Listen, for you note takers, underline that. God didn't tell her not to touch it. She, we're already seeing legalism kind of creep in to, to God's people. right? God didn't say don't touch it. He said don't eat it, lest you die. Verse 4, then the serpent said to the woman, he says, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. Your little eyeball on your forehead, already back then, right? Your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So listen, number one, Satan questions God's word. Number two for your note takers is, number two is Satan questions God's love. This is what he does. You may think, Pastor, you're going too deep on this. I'm not. If you understand who the enemy is, what the Bible says, you will begin to walk in victory. That's how it is. You know, people, you either are going to do like 4,000, 10 million, trillion, you know, pat your nose, spin around, you know, one foot, or you're going to, as Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will what? That's how this stuff works. Once you get to, oh my goodness, what a dummy, right? Number one, he questions God's word. Number two, he will question God's love. I'm going to guess he's done that to some of you guys this afternoon before you got here. This is how he does it. This is what he does. He doesn't have to change his tactics. It works. She engages in a nice, friendly conversation. You know, you wonder why the man didn't fall for it first because he didn't care. He just walked. He's like, I don't like you anyways. Get out of my face. He kept walking. She was, God, she was a big Christian, you know. Hi, how you doing, Mr. Serpent, right? I'm just a little joke. <laughs> you know, possibly she could have thought, maybe we could work some things out, you know? I could reunite you and, you and God, right? Not the, not, the, not the job, but anyhow. Now notice Satan comes to the woman, and he questions God's word. This is the first question mark in the Bible, as I said earlier. Satan challenges the word, but number two, he questions God's love. What is Satan implying in this text? This is what he's implying. He's saying, would a good God of love keep something from his creation? Would he keep something from you? If he really loved you, wouldn't he let you have this tree as well? 
And this is how the enemy does it. Notice how it's worded. Notice it. Satan, he says, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. God says, God doesn't say that. Satan twists it to be this negative thing, right? You got, I mean, literally God created billions and billions of trees to eat of. He says, just one don't eat of, because I want to have a real relationship with you, and a real relationship requires choice. Satan says, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. That's how he says it. What's he implying? God's keeping something that's really good from you. Right? This is how he does it. He questions God's love. God says to him, God said to them earlier on, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Notice what Satan does. This is what he does. He turns a positive invitation into a negative prohibition. This is what he does today. If you begin to dialogue with the enemy, what God blesses you with will begin to be a curse in your life. But it will only be a curse in your mind. It's a lie. I see this happen. I have literally have people come to me, Pastor, will you pray for me that God would provide this for me? And we pray. And then God provides it. And then two weeks later, they come, it's the worst. It's so bad. I'm going, you ask God for this. And, it, and I'm watching, and it's not bad. It's that the enemy is excellent mudslinger. He is very good at this. He got Adam and Eve to be convinced, your life stinks, man. You don't got to go to work. Your job is to name animals. You get to walk with Jesus every day, right? You eat of the most perfect fruit ever invented ever. I mean, imagine these guys. It must be rough jumping off the, you know, the waterfall, right? Oh, it's worse. And he could, it's so bad. Why? Why is it so bad? Because there's, He's keeping that one tree from you. It's bad. And they bought it. We buy it too, guys. I hate to say it. We buy it. He comes and he tells us, he's implying that God does not love you or want you to have any fun. He's a liar, man. He's a liar. Number three, if you're taking note, jot this down. Because this is how the progression works. It doesn't change. It's the same today as it was about you know, 6,000 years ago here in Genesis. Number three is then after he questions God's word, after number two, he questioned God's love. Number three, Satan flat out denies God's word. Then he comes at him. Once he's got you a little, little woozy, once he's got you a little wounded, a little shaky, maybe, maybe this isn't God's word. Maybe Jesus doesn't love me. Then he lands the punch. And he flat out denies God's word. Verse 4, he says, you will not surely die. He questions, then he questions God's love, and then he says the opposite. He contradicts the word of God. He lies to him. He tells him, you will see this, you'll see just like God sees. That's not true. He lies. And I'm going to tell you this. You will see the same approach by Satan today. Question God's word, question God's love, and then flat out deny the word. The main issue Satan's after. Listen, listen, brother, sister. If you can catch this. I'm not saying you'll never stumble again or you'll never struggle again, but this is a big truth that sets man free. The main truth that Satan is after in your life is can God really be trusted? That's what he wants. He wants you to go, can I really rely on God? It's, it's, um, it's remarkable that this works because what is the alternative? The government? I mean, come on, man. Wake up, right? What's the alternative? Another person? Some world ideology? You know, I love the days we're living in. I love them. It's a fun day to be a Christian. You know, I get to talk to people who go, you believe the Bible? Really? You believe Jesus? Cain died on the cross, rose from the dead? Really? I go, what I do is I go up on a mountain, I stare at the sun, waiting for the eyeball to open up. I go, I know it's really tough what I believe. It takes a lot of faith, you know. You keep going, you know, with your robe on and everything, right? It, it's a really amazing day. My, my kids and I, we were watching this, uh, this show. You know, you, you try to watch these educational shows. It was on, uh, you know, like astronomy. They're trying to find the Pluto. The Pluto thing. You guys ever read about this? The Pluto? Where they, they sent it out all millions of dollars into the Pluto. 
And it's amazing. As you're watching it, they're just they're trying to convince you. You're going, what is motivating them to do this? And they said it. They, they'd be honest. They said, they said, we're trying to discover where the earth came from and how it was created. Well, man, you could have given me the $900 million. I could have read Genesis 1-1 to you. It would be easier, you know? But it was amazing as we're watching it, because my kid, you know, my son Luke kind of looks at me, and they literally were, they said this over and over again. They showed these computer images of like random masses crashing into each other. They're saying billions of years ago, we believe these masses crashed into each other. They broke up, because where Pluto is, there was this whole debate, you know, was it 10 years ago? Pluto may not be a planet, because there's all these other large, you know, objects out there, but they believe they saw the, these masses hit each other and they're floating out in space. But then they showed how over billions, billions of years, these random rocks that ran into each other and broke up, then they coalesced together. And they began to, it was incredible as you watched the, I was like, wow, they have, it almost looked like they had footage of this. And they come together and all of a sudden the jagged rocks become a sphere. And as time goes on, it turns blue and then green. And all of a sudden there's life. It's amazing. It's just like everything we've experienced, right? Doesn't everybody, you get in a car accident and your car comes together better than it was before, <laughs> right? Every one of us, we go to bed at night. Our breath smells better in the morning. And our hair is better combed, right? That's how, it, that's how everything works, isn't it? Right? You know? Do you know that if I took a pile of rubble and I left it here on the stage for 100 million years? No, let's give them more time. 100 billion years. That we'd come back, it wouldn't all of a sudden turn into, you know, the statue of Michelangelo. It would actually, that's not what science shows us. What science shows us, it would be even more chaotic than it was when we left it 100 billion years before. But this is what the enemy does. First, he questions God's word. Then he questions God's love. Then he comes and he flat out denies what the Bible says and says something in its place. And this is what he does. He says, you will not surely die. What he is after, it's Satan's agenda. He always has one, and his main agenda is to get you and I to question if we can rely on God, if we can trust God. <laughs> and you go, imagine, you know, as, as you'll see happen here. Well, as they stop relying on God, guess who you have to transfer your allegiance to? Oh, yeah, he's, Satan's real trustworthy. You see, God's agenda has always been the same. In Genesis to this day, God's agenda is still the same. God has given man freedom. But God has also given man dominion over this earth. You and I have choices we get to make. You and I get to, get to watch as, as we can live with the Lord and watch our lives change. But they both, but both of Adam and Eve had a limitation they could not do whatever they wanted whenever they wanted to do it. You see, Satan offers that to us. He just forgets to tell us if we do that, our lives will completely fall apart and we'll basically not even want to live anymore. He leaves that one little piece out. But God says, listen, I've created you to be free. I've created you to have dominion, but you still have responsibilities. And he says, any tree, but you are still responsible to me. And I believe this is programmed into man's deepest understanding. I believe it's still there today. Ecclesiastes says God has put eternity in the hearts of men. I believe it's still there. I believe man is trying so hard today to convince themselves that there is no God. But the fight alone proves that they know something is true. It proves it. And we see this here. Let's move on. We've got we to at least finish verse 7, right? Verse 6, what's this? I just, one more thing. <laughs> I just want to encourage you guys. I really do. Because we're living in a day, I mean, you're here at Calvary Chapel on a Wednesday night studying your Bible. So, you know, I hate to tell you, you're moving up the list on Satan's, you know, <laughs> America's most wanted. Um, you have to trust the Lord. I know I said this, but this is what it's all about. Because God, God doesn't look on at what's happening in this world. God doesn't look on what's happening in the church. I mean, I remember... Um, you know, I left Florida in 2002, and I remember I had helped this one fella who had got there 
basically made the connections, got him a space, you know, love the Lord, man. This guy, I love the Lord. And I was leaving and he was coming. So I helped him kind of get the church started and, you know, was a part of some of the prayer meetings, some Bible studies. I taught at, at a couple of the first gatherings. And I remember I went back, I went back about, I don't know, 10 years later. And church was, it was much, much bigger. Florida doesn't take much, but it, much bigger. And I remember getting there, and I, I'll never forget this. You could not find a Bible in the entire building. There was not a Bible in there. I remember going to some of the elders, and the pastor wasn't there either. You couldn't find the pastor or a Bible, so it was interesting. But, uh, you know, I went there, and I said, can I have a Bible? Do you have a Bible anywhere? Oh, yeah, yeah. We don't. I'll never forget. One of the guys just told me, well, you don't really, it's too much for people. We try to not. I'm like, <laughs> almost had a heart attack. I genuinely, I, you know, somebody who's here tonight was there. I literally almost had a heart attack, you know. I said, what is going on? It, it, once Satan removes that, then he can get you to not trust the Lord. It's where it happens. You know, as, you read your, as you read your word and you pray every single day, all of a sudden, man, the word becomes flesh and makes his dwelling, and you begin to trust the Lord. As you go, how could I not? Your word comes to pass. All right, let's move on. Verse 6. So when the woman saw, note that, she saw first that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant uh, to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. So we see here who was really responsible for all. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> kidding. I couldn't help it. I only get to do that once a year. So once a lifetime possibly. But she took and he ate, right? Uh, I want you to note the sequence here. Number one, she saw. The first step was she looked at what Satan pointed her towards. It's not that complicated, guys. You know, big shocker, big secret. You and I do not need to talk to the devil, okay? We don't need to. Uh, even in the book of Jude, the Bible says Michael the an an archangel, and he actually has to do battle with Lucifer. Michael the archangel, in doing battle with Satan, said the Lord rebuke you. You and I are not conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Satan has nothing to be said to us. And we don't really have to say anything to him either. But when we do that, we actually lower ourselves, whether you understand it or not. You are, the Bible says, are part of a royal priesthood. You are a son and a daughter of God. Satan has to wait in line, the Bible says in Job, to talk to God. The Bible says you and I can come boldly before the throne of grace. If you've ever been to my office, everybody has to knock except for my children. They can come right in, no matter what we're talking about. They, I mean, if, you get, if you're in there, you could be, oh. and we'll say, we'll burst the door, Dad, and I'll give her candy. I will totally ignore you. I will just go right to her. That's you and me, man. That's us. But Satan... You know, this is what we see. We have to learn this lesson. She saw, she looked at what Satan told her to look at. You don't, we don't need to talk to him. Then she took, number two. Then number three, she ate, and then she gave. Now, now listen, some would say, you know, Eve was the culprit here. But notice here, Eve takes four steps to fall. Adam only takes one step. One step, right? She was social with the serpent. I will say that was her mistake. She was social with the serpent. You know, the Bible tells us later on, for you note takers, you could jot it down, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. The Bible tells us Eve was actually deceived. You know, when, when Adam, when, when the serpent told Eve, listen, you eat of this fruit, it'll make you more like God. She actually was like, well, I want to be more godly, so I'll do this. But the Bible says Adam was not deceived. <laughs> Adam just flat out disobeyed. <laughs> he said, you know, I don't really care what you say, God, I'm going to do this. You know, remember just last chapter, if you're with us last week, remember he saw the woman, he said, whoa, man. Now all of a sudden he finds out she ate and he's going to be separated. He says, God, you're going to have to figure this one out. Goodbye. You know, he goes, that's it. But that's what happens here. This is the original sin, guys. This is where sin entered the world. If you're taking note, jot it down. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 20 through 22. It's there, Paul tells us that as in Adam all die, right, through his sin. Now, you and I, basically, whether you understand this or not, you know, the Bible does teach we are born in sin and iniquity. That's what the Bible says. It's almost as if a, a, a virus was, was from this point on, 
in mankind's bloodstream, in our DNA. And it was passed on from that day until today. Still born in sin, still have a sinful nature. Not God's original design. Rebelled against God. But there in 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible says, as in Adam all die. The Bible says, in Jesus is not the second Adam. The Bible calls him the last Adam. And in Jesus, all have been made alive. That Jesus destroyed sin's curse in our lives. That Jesus, as the Bible says, whom the Son says free, is free indeed. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a what? New creation. You know what that word means, new creation, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17? It means original form. That in Christ, God brings us back to, guess what? Original form. We get to walk with him again. It's all been made possible by Jesus Christ. You know, you ever, you ever seen, you know, our sponsor is this company, right? Our sponsor is Jesus Christ, guys. He's made it all possible. He paid the bill. We just get to wear the shirt, you know? We're in Christ. It's Adam's bomb. You know, the Adam bomb here. And it's spread. The fallout has been more than we could imagine. You know, the reason why we have trouble believing this is because we do not understand the severity of rebelling against God. We don't understand the severity of sin. Sin is not good. <laughs> sin is bad, man. Sin destroys things. You know, we look on this world. I keep hearing people say, why is God doing all this? God is not doing this. God is diving into this cesspool and rescuing people out of it through Jesus Christ. It's Satan doing this, and it's sin. And it's those who, you know, are functioning under his plan that he brought here in Genesis. Well, let's wrap it up. Verse 7, one with this verse. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Kind of a scary thing, you know. All of a sudden, you're like, ah, you know, they knew they were naked. And they so noticed this. It's the beginning of self-righteousness, right at the beginning, right? You want to understand self-righteousness? Read it here. And they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves coverings. Now, I have a personal opinion here. I'll find out if I'm right when I get to heaven. I got a feeling they found a poison ivy bush, personally. You know, it's just me. Maybe, you know, but probably not. Number four, the temptation and fall of man, our last point of the evening. Be made alive by Jesus. Be made made alive by Jesus. Brother, sister, you may think we're living at the darkest time in history. I believe this moment is the darkest time in human history. Every bad thing that follows this is the fallout from Adam's bomb. All the pain, the death, the horror that follows is a result of the fall. But we will also see God's rescue operation. You know, next week you'll see the first prophecy in the Bible is where, where God is going to say, you know, to the serpent, he says, listen, man's foot, you know, the seed of man, which will be Jesus Christ, will crush your skull. But you'll bruise his heel. But he's going to crush your skull. At the cross, Jesus Christ crushed Satan's skull. The Bible says he took the keys of Hades. He set the captives free. But now, as I said earlier, almost like a hidden virus in the bloodstream of the human race. Listen, a hidden virus that would infect everyone, worse than HIV, listen, <laughs> worse than COVID-19. This is the sin virus. And listen, it is absolutely fable, fatal. And it separates everyone forever from God unless they receive the cure. And the cure, it's the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the cure. The cure is the cross. This is what the Bible teaches. How serious are the consequences of the fall? It's so serious. It's so serious. I was thinking about this, that we're blinded to how bad it really is. We still today, we're still blaming all these other things, not realizing, man, sin is bad. <laughs> sin hurts us. It hurts people we love. It, it destroys. Now, I'm going to read this to you, and we'll basically close here. Romans chapter 5. Hey, could you turn there with me real quick? I want you to connect these dots. Romans 5, it's the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 5, we're going to read verse 12 through 17. I want you to see this because it, it, it may open up Romans 5 for you for the first time now that we've kind of dissected Genesis 3. Romans 5, 12 through 17. That is the best sound in the world. 
people reading their Bibles, right? Romans 5.12, I'll start off slow so you can catch up. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, this is Adam, Adam's bomb, through one man sin entered the world, Romans 5 verse 12, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned, verse 13, for until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Verse 15, look at this. But the free gift is not like the offense. So the free gift, what Jesus provides for us, is not like the offense that Adam sinned in the garden. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded to many. You see that? So Adam committed one sin, rebelled against God, and it destroyed humanity. Sin entered into humankind and destroyed everything. This was Satan's objective. This is what he was trying to accomplish in heaven, which failed. So now he comes down to earth to the first man, the first woman, and he accomplishes his objective. He gets God's creation to rebel against their creator. But God had a plan. It was his own son who would die in our place. And listen, the free gift is not like the offense. Much more the grace of God, the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. Verse 16, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification, meaning just as if you never sinned. God the Father looks at you tonight. If you have received Jesus as your Savior, he looks at you tonight just as if you have never sinned. When you approach him, he doesn't see you the way you see yourself. He sees you as if you've never sinned. I know that is impossible to believe, but that's why it's called faith. And that's why it's, a, it's the cross. This is why we, we praise the Lord. That's why Paul says, I boast in the cross. I boast in the cross. I don't care how foolish people might think I am. Because it's, it's the righteousness of God. Verse 17, for if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, listen, much more those who receive abundance of grace that you and I and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So what Satan accomplished by getting Adam and Eve to sin, God fixed, he cured through his own son, Jesus Christ. Through one act of obedience, of going to the cross in our place. <laughs> you know, as we close tonight, and that's it for the study, but I'll say this, as we close tonight, if you don't recognize that you're really sick, or you have cancer, or you have a, a really bad sickness, you're not going to go to the doctor. You're not going to go to the hospital. And it's the same. It's the same. I, I think still tonight, there are many people that are churched, that are sowing fig leaves together and making their own righteousness. That is what is called religion. And, and, and I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I'm telling you, according to God's word, it's not going to work. You're going to see it next week that God's going to make them garments. He's not going to say, you know, why make you garments? You made such beautiful poison ivy uh, outfits, you know. <laughs> Go ahead, give it. You know, God. And so, no, I'm going to make you a new garment. You'll see the first animal sacrifice next week. Right away, death has to come in in order for covering. But listen, tonight, if you're here, you know, I want to say this. You'll never come to the Savior unless you admit, confess you're a sinner in need of salvation. That's where it all starts. You know, I know it's Wednesday night at Calvary, so you guys are super saved, but not everybody, you know. You might be here and go, Lord, <laughs> you've, been, you've been trying in your own strength. You know, God wants you to, to set you free. Confess, say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of a savior. Forgive me, wash me, cleanse me. Exchange your righteousness. Exchange your fig leaves for the righteousness of Christ. Exchange your attempt to maybe make it to heaven by the skin of your teeth for being a son and a daughter of God because that's what he offers. You know, 
If the enemy's really been battering you lately, listen, number one, he's going to question God's word. So guess what that means? What should you be doing? Be in the word. Yeah. That's how afraid he is of this book. You know, listen, this thing changed 12 apostles who were the biggest misfits of all, right? Except for Judas. He was great. You know, 12 of them. And it turned them into men of God. You know, women. Mary Magdalene had seven demons Jesus cast out. You know, and she was a servant of the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit. So credible. Stick with God's word. Number two, he's going to get you to believe that God doesn't love you. <laughs> That's what he's going to come after. You know, but, but Jesus, listen, he's going to say, greater love is none than this. Listen, man, I laid my life down for you. If you don't believe I love you, I don't know what else. I mean, I send you a little love note, but I mean, my goodness, I send you 66 of them. It's called the Bible, once again. And I laid my life down for you. And then third, he's going to flat out deny the truth of God's word. That's what he's going to do. He's going to say, no, nope, God's wrong. God's wrong. No, no, no. Billions and millions of years ago, stardust appeared. <laughs> Out of the goo came you. That's what he's going to tell you. We're wondering why all these young people are committing suicide. We're, we're literally watching what happens when an entire generation believes that their life is meaningless, and this is purposeless. This is what we're watching. But last but not least, we can't just stop there. We have to be made alive by Jesus. We have to. We have to realize, yes, the curse is bad, and yes, even today, if you're a child of God, you know I'm, a, I'm saved, but I'm a sinner saved by grace. We still have this fallen nature. Paul tells us in Romans 7, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death, you know? Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I practice. Oh, who will deliver me? But Paul says, thanks be to Jesus Christ. And then that's Romans chapter 8. It's to be filled with the Spirit. That's what God has for us. So listen, as we leave this place tonight, listen, see the world biblically. See it how God's Word says. All the stuff going around, it's, it's inevitable. It's the fall of man. But we have the cure. Brother, sister, you have the cure. There's somebody that's going to come across your path this week that the Holy Spirit has already prepared. Now listen, don't take out the needle, the big needle one. Don't do that, you know. <laughs> Tell them about Jesus. Tell them the good news. Let's chill out with our good views, right? Let's share the good news. You'll watch people get saved. And when people get saved, God changes everything, right? Just like he did in you, just like he did in me. Amen? Amen. All right, let's close in prayer. Great listeners tonight, thank you so much. Father, thank you for your word. God, we thank you tonight, Lord, for the reality that, that there is a book, Lord, that you have given us called the Word of God, that Paul says that all Scripture is God-breathed. Peter says that there's no private interpretation, but holy men of God were moved by the Spirit that penned this. And Lord, we thank you, Lord. You give us some insight into the reality, Lord, that every one of us here, when we were born, spiritually speaking, were dead upon arrival. But Lord, we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you laid your life down for us, and we thank you tonight that, Lord, as, as your word says, that those who have believed on your name, you have given the right to be called children of God. And God, we just thank you. That is, your word says, that is what we are. We are children of God. And I pray just for that identity to wash over us tonight. And God, I pray as we leave this place that we would go into this broken, hurting, confused, I don't even think upside down is a proper adjective any longer, world, maybe inside out. But Lord, we would share the message that you use to change our lives. God, just, just grip us, Lord, the, the sin that once held us down. Lord, the lies, the enemy, we used to fall prey to so often. Lord, we pray tonight that we would know the truth, that Greek word, gnosko. We would experience the truth. We would know it, and the truth would set us free. So, Lord, help us to walk with you. Bless your people tonight. We, we thank you for all that you're doing in us and through us, and we praise you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Great. Read ahead. We'll be in Genesis next week, too, and then this Sunday, the book of Acts. God bless you all.